Hello, everybody. I hope you enjoyed that. That was a lot of fun. That was a collection of incredible musicians that were actually put together by Michael Humphreys. Michael is a wonderful guitar player, incredible guitar player, incredible piano player, arranger, musical director, and kind of a TikTok star, actually. I remember we'll put a TikTok link under here as well for you to check him out, as well as being pretty huge on Instagram. But outside of that, he's an incredibly talented musician, ridiculously talented. So thank you, Michael, for putting it together. You can look him up on those formats, by the way, under the name Future Self. Now, you probably, if you have been online at all, will know who Jesus Molina was. Jesus Molina, the keyboard player, is huge. He plays massive shows all over the place. One of the most insanely talented piano players I've ever heard in my life. The bass was Joe Cleveland, an incredible bass player. Absolutely amazing bass player. Again, on many, many albums that you love. And Paige Cooper, what a drummer and what a sweetheart. I mean, all of these guys were absolutely incredible. Paige was a total sweetheart. Joe, Jesus, and of course, our good friend, Michael. I'm sure you'll see Michael a lot more in our videos because we love having him about. Of course, he already just did one with uh, Mikhail. What we did on these songs is literally just set up the mix in the control room. So you'll notice that, so you'll notice that Michael was just sitting here and he was using the deluxe reverb amp, which was crazy. So it was like bleeding into the room. And then you had Joe over here, and Jesus in front of the amp over there. So Jesus was only hearing himself through the speakers, and Joe was only hearing himself through the speakers, and Michael was getting a blend of the amp bleeding into the room and the speakers. And then of course we had Paige playing drums in the other room who was listening on headphones. So one guy on headphones, and then everybody else listening through the rather glorious um, Joan Scallon speakers. So thank God we had them because they're loud. But what was interesting about it, of course, is that I had to make the mix usable for everybody in the room, which meant that the guitar was actually panned over to the right-hand speaker slightly and the keyboard over to the left. That was not really in relation necessarily where they were sitting, definitely for Jesus, who was over on that side, but more about getting them away from each other. Now for bass, Joe wanted it loud. I'm bringing this up because Michael actually loved the rough mixes. He loved the sound in the room. That's no kick and snare sample. That's just the sound of the drums dry with nothing specifically going on. There's a bit of room on the snare and a bit of room on the kick, but that is what the drummer, Paige, was also hearing as well. What you actually end up hearing in that video is, believe it or not, what the band were hearing in the room. We didn't do another mix. Michael really liked it. Now, Mark has gone on and done his own mix, and he's gonna break that down and show you how he did his mix in another video. But in this video, I'm just literally gonna show you what I did on the console. What is interesting about this, in all honesty, is like, this was pretty much our starting point when we come and mix on the console, and our hybrid workflow with tiny tweaking just tiny tweaking for the people in the room. I never thought that this was gonna be the final mix. We thought we were gonna have a mixed day and mix it, but no, this is what Michael fell in love with. He's like, I love this. And Mark mixed it as well, but he ended up loving the original feel in the room. So there's something quite magical about that and a good lesson for us where you end up doing what feels right in the room, what feels good for everybody, and it's hard to beat. I've met so many people have told me that their rough mixes are almost impossible to beat. And then so many other people have told me that their rough mixes are what you hear on the record. That They did spend $70,000 on a famous mixer only to find out that their rough mixes were better. So it's a good lesson. And it's also a reminder to always bounce your mix wherever you're at. When I'm working with like Mark Ender mixing, he does EODs, end of day. So he'll be mixing a song and it might be the second half of the day he started on it. So maybe in the morning he was you know, finishing up on the mix. And then he sends me an EOD, an end of day mix. And then he gets in the next morning and he tweaks it, but he's already got that mix saved that he'll tweak it, but maybe he'll go back to the end of day one and think, oh, I preferred where I was at, or I took it too far this way, I took it too far that way. The point is, whenever you finish tracking, whenever you think it's rough mixing, whenever you finished any element of what you're doing, overdubs, make a mix, because you never know. 
that might be the best it's ever going to sound. And that's not a problem if it's early in the process and it sounds amazing. That's a quality problem. So always be bouncing. End of day, end of session, end of working on that song, maybe moving on to another one. Make a quick rough mix. Make a mix so you have something to reference. Okay, so let's talk about it. I'm going to pick one of the songs. There's Fall in Love and Radius. This is the full band ones. So let's go to Radius. Now, of course, you can download these multi-tracks down below. This is all recorded live in the room. Everybody performing together. Couple of things that I'm sure the experts are going to complain about. Feel free, experts, to complain. We were clipping the schnizzle on this snare. Absolutely clipping the schnizzle ass out of it. Um, it really was hitting hard, but it was sounding good, so we left it. Now, if I zoom in on this snare, you don't see a huge amount of squaring off, but it is squaring off. And we didn't seem to care. We did not seem to care. So if I listen to the drums for a second. You know, I remember we didn't end up using the reverbs on the kick and snare. This is just the dry, because we were going for a dry 70s thing, because we wanted this to be, you know, what it sounds like, like a, a classic 70s rock, 70s jazz rock performance, you know. Some of my favorite records are like Blow by Blow, you know, Headhunters. Everybody who loves music loves Herbie Hancock, Headhunters loves Jeff Beck. Blow by Blow, I mean, those are two of the best sounding records of all time. And they are performances by incredible musicians with that 70s dry drum sound. So here it is. And that's the mic on the outside of the kick, snare top, snare bottom mic individual tom mics. The way the drummer played was fantastic, so the articulation of the toms, the bleed is almost non-existent. Overheads are peeking out as well. Now we did have one advantage, one massive, massive advantage. The drums were going through the Kadak console, which has a coloration which I absolutely love. So again, monitoring through the console becomes the rough mix. The headphone mix that went to the drummer, off of the console. Everything that you hear on here is what the musicians heard in the room. So yes, the bass is a little, little loud, but we still absolutely love it. The room mic is just the U47 vocal mic left up and printed. So it's just where the vocal mic would be, reflected off of the glass. I mean, that's... That's a drum loop. I mean, take that and write a new song over it. He comes in, doesn't know the room, doesn't know the drum kit, and just performs brilliantly. I mean, that is a mark of a great, great drummer. So Paige, you rock. So a quick listen to the bass. Now, the bass was just a DI. And he printed those effects. So he had that chorusing, that was on the bass.
All of the compression and EQ, everything is on the console. Say it, Jesus. Nothing better than real musicians. I mean, it's just a joy, an absolute joy to have players of that, that pedigree and that quality just sitting in a room and playing, just super players. All right, let's go down. As you can see, not a heck of a lot is happening. It really is. No reverb whatsoever on any drums, no reverb on anything. Any effects that were on the guitar or on the bass are printed on the guitar and the bass. The only EQ and compression would have been on the console. So let's go down and strap on the device. You saw me using this last week. It's going back on the GoPro. So first of all, we didn't have any reverb on the kick, but there is some EQ on the kick master. It's pretty typical what I'm doing. I'm pulling out a little bit of 300, boosting a little bit of like 7K-ish, anything to just give it some bite, 10K, some 5K for a bit more snap, and some 50. So no low mid cut there. We did the rest of it on the console. So let's go and look at the console. Now the console is gonna seem familiar because this was kind of defaulting where I usually start off. So let's start off the kick. So to explain, this is pretty typical for me. First of all, it's hitting the console very hard. Very, very hard. So it's kind of got that spongy smash in the console. A lot of 60 hertz boost there. We get in super close. You'll see I've got 9 dB of 60 hertz. I've got a cut more around like seven or 800 hertz. And not so much on the 350 area. Um, I've got a boost going on at about 2K. But if I take the EQ out, well, it's making a big difference. And then I've got about 7K boost. But that, all that high-end boost is just there to make it feel like it's got some kind of attack. The other thing, of course, that we're doing is our kick EQ here, which again is boosting at 63. A little bit of cut at 250 and 125 to get it out of the way of the bass guitar at about 125, and a bit of 4K boost. And of course, the one other thing that we always love to do, and that's subharmonic synthesizer, which is being smashed pretty hard. It's funny that, it's, that it is a jazz band, and yet I'm hitting everything a little bit more aggressively. You would imagine, you know, the stereotype would be is everything would be pretty, but no. I mean, we're, we're overly hitting the tracks on the snare, for instance. We're annihilating it, it's, it's clipping, but we still dig it. You know, things things are not going down pretty. Things are going down quickly and like this, like band members in the room. It's not perfect at all, but the sound has energy and it has a great performance. I think this is more important to notice. Now, there's actually quite a lot of overload going on here, which means the sub, which is coming back on this channel here, is hitting pretty hard. Now, if I float the kick out of the bus, So still quite a lot of low end. Now a lot of 60 hertz there. Bring it back in. Pushing a lot there.
So the subharmonic synthesizer adds a lot of additional lows. Really, really cool. I have no problem, you know, no problem really boosting that kind of low end and carving out some of the low mids like that. Like I said, you go and look at Joe Ciccarelli, who's one of the greatest engineers that ever lived, let alone greatest engineer at the moment. He does so much dramatic EQ on his drums to get them to sound so amazing. I'm not afraid of doing that at all. Okay, let's listen to the snare top and snare bottom. So it's going into a snare master EQ, which is really just, yeah, just a boost of like 7.5K essentially. Um, so everything you're going to hear on this is really being done on the console. We didn't use any reverb. There's some time adjuster, which is knocking it back in time with the overheads so that the overheads and snare print in phase. Now, here, we've got some 5K twice. So boosting 5K here. 5k here, believe it or not, double. Then I've got about 150 and 100. Take that out. Quite boxy. So essentially, I'm just doing smiley face. Smiley face. Woohoo, like this. And then, of course, snare here. Some 125 boost, some 250 boost. Bit of 2k. Take that off. And a bit of 8K. Now, I think the toms are where I probably did the most drastic amount of work in the box. So if I take this section here of the toms, Again, I've got time adjuster, which is knocking it back in time. Now, some people drag the tracks and move them back, but it's knocking back in time with the overheads. So I just calculate the waveform, looking at the waveform on the toms and the waveform on the overheads and just make them match. So if it's like, in this instance, it is 97 samples and I brought it back. So it's time adjuster on both of them. Now I'm getting quite aggressive. So I've got 78, so about 80 Hertz is just wiped off. And I'm actually limiting them. just to get some level. And then our bass, which is at 80 hertz. Now, you're probably saying, well, he just like high pass to 80 hertz. That's, that's something I do a lot. So I'm cleaning up underneath. If I boosted 80 hertz on its own, the 80 hertz would come up, but so would also like 60 and 40 and all this unknown kind of low end on a tom, which I don't need on a rack tom. So I'm cleaning up what goes into it. So I'm sending like a high pass at 78, so basically 80 hertz. And then when it boosts, yeah, it's pulling up some 40 and 60, but a nice clean amount. I like doing that on the way in. I feel like it feels more natural. I do the same thing with reverbs. People ask me all the time, do I EQ before or after reverb sends? I always do it before. Because that way there's an, it might be a little extra generated low end and high end, but it sounds natural. So if, I, if I'm sending like a kick drum to a reverb, I don't want a huge amount of low end so one way to do would be to send the kick drum to the reverb and then put the EQ afterwards. I don't want to do that. It sounds really artificial and really too controlled. But if I EQ going into the reverb, send the kick into an EQ, pull out all the excessive low end, then put the reverb afterwards, there is going to be a little bit of that generated low end, but nice and tasteful, not quite so you know heavily EQ'd sounding. To me, that's always been something I hated when I first started recording and I had fresh kid ears I hated hearing the sound of the EQs. You know what I mean? I liked encouraging things, but as soon as it sounded like it was like, you know, like an EQ only, that's where I got horrible. And that seemed to be really exaggerated to me on things like reverbs, et cetera, or bass boosts where you were trying to control it afterwards. Always, for me at least, always control before you go into something. And then let that little excessiveness happen and it would just feel more natural. Exactly the same thing on the floor. Yeah, identical. A little bit of limiting. A bit more aggressive on that because he's playing it louder. And then of course the R bass afterwards. And the full drum kit. Now the hat mic, I believe, was it an SM7 or a 57? What were we using, Eric? Uh, if it's our usual, it's an SM7. We think it was probably the SM7.
and the overheads. Now, let's go have a quick review. So if I go to that Tom section again, let's take, let's take something where both Toms are playing, which would be in here. And we will listen on the console. Now this is quite typical for me. I've actually got, if you see, I've got the inserts turned on here. And those inserts are actually going over here. So on the kick and the snare, that's the kick, there's the snare, here's the toms where they're soloed. I'm actually increasing the attack quite dramatically and the sustain quite dramatically on the toms. I sometimes do that because when I'm cleaning up the toms, I might get rid of cymbal bleed. And when you do that, it ends up shortening the decay somewhat. So I exaggerate the sustain. And then who doesn't want more attack on their toms? Of course we do, so that's our toms. With the snare, you can see, I barely increased the sustain. It's probably just set to zero, but I did increase the snap and attack. And with the kick, I did both. I increased the sustain and the attack. Transient designers, whether they be plug-in form or hardware form, are really, really useful when it comes to mixing drums. You can have fun with them. You can do with rooms. You can exaggerate the kick, snare, kick, kick, snare, tom hits, or you can do the opposite and just make it just disgusting and all sustained and smushy and exciting. A lot of people, and myself included over the years, will print back through. You know, we'll take a drum sound and print back through and then have stereo tracks that have been annihilated either for extra energy or for the opposite, for hyper attack and then blend them back in. That was the thing I would do when I only had hardware transient designer and I didn't have access to plugins or I just wanted to have a mix that was easy to recall. Because the other great thing about printing these stems is that when you come and mix, you've got something no matter where you are. Whether you have a console, whether you're mixing in a box, you've got the tracks already processed. So if you have one or you have access to a hardware transient designer, try that. Try printing back through it and then blending it against your original drum sounds. So one more time, let's go and listen to the rack and floor tom and check out what the settings were on the console. So what I've got going on here is pretty typical for me. Boosted 100 hertz on both of these. So 100 hertz, 100 hertz, 100 hertz. I'm actually high passing up to 70 on both. A bit of low passing at about 12, 10 or 12K, anywhere around there. I could even go down a little bit. And then there's quite a dramatic boost at like 6K for just, for just like high end attack. Plus we've got, of course, the transit designer doing that. And then a bit more attack at about 4K here, more there, but this is really the biggest thing. It's at about 300-ish, and I am cutting like crazy. 12 dB of low mids reduced. So let's have a listen without the EQ on. Cardboard boxes. Probably how they sound in a room, but you hear that attack come to life and that body bottom end, take it out. Horrible honky cardboard boxes, EQ back in beautiful 70s soundies toms. Okay, let's go over to the hi-hat and the overheads. You can hear the toms in it, so that's, that's kind of nice. We'll keep it going there. So no, nothing on the low end here, no need to boost or cut. I am high passing up to 120, so I don't want any low lows. If I take the EQ out, it still sounds pretty good. Could have used that. Uh, a tiny, tiny about a uh, boost about 5k. No boost to 10k, but sometimes I will do boost to 10k. It was ready if I needed it. Mainly a cut at 350 again, and no boost at low end. So, so mainly low mid cut and a tiny amount of high mid boost. That low mid cut is there specifically for drums like the rack and floor tom because I want those toms you know, if I got the overheads up, to not sound crappy when they're stuck with, you know, the overhead mics and the natural sounds themselves. Uh, all right, last but not least is the room mic, which of course was the U48, pointed in the singing position kind of really generically. It's coming down mono through a stereo send. 
So we let out the EQ. EQ in. I'm cutting at about 80, 70, 80. High passing up to about 70 or 80. Boosting at about nine or 10K. Little boost at 7K. So a nice lift from like seven, eight, nine, 10. And then quite a huge cut. Well, not a huge, huge, but a relatively big cut at about three or 400. Out. Back in, you can hear the difference. It's the low mid cut that's biggest. Now, it's, it's barely compressing, but what you're hearing as compression is a vocal mic setting that we were using where we were going through our BAE 1028, going into our DBX 165 into our 1176. So this was a quite aggressive compression because Somebody who was singing on it may have been doing, you know, ain't no sunshine when she's gone. But when there's a drummer going crazy in there, the compression is pretty dramatic. So have a listen. It's dramatic, but it's fantastic. Old drum sound again. As you can see, the room mic's not very loud, but you can try that. You can try putting a room mic up. You can do whatever you like. You can put some samples in there. You can use reverb on the kick and snare. You can go crazy. But again, this was just my rough mix. Get it sound quickly. Get it sound good quickly in the room. I mean, we were up and tracking within minutes of people arriving. You know, we didn't keep people waiting for hours. We were just like, let's get going. Just sound check the mics. Make sure everything's up and going. And then tweet, 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 tweet on the board. Everything ready. Oh, let's record some songs. Two full band songs and then a couple of acoustic ones, like you know, piano, piano, guitar, and then guitar on its own. And I think we put a vocal or two down. I mean, basically, it was a lot of work done in a couple of hours with musicians that had never played together, ever. You know, they've played together in different projects in combinations of one or two of the guys, but that set all coming together, they learned the songs in the room with Michael at the time and then recorded them. Yep. And as you can see, this is, how many takes do we do with this? We did four, four takes of this song. The first song, we did three takes from never ever playing it before. Amazing players. Okay, let's go over to the bass. And as you heard before, it's pretty raw. It is just the DI. It helps that Joe is an incredible bass player. This is that right hand technique. off. What great players. Joe Cleveland and Paige Cooper, ladies and gentlemen. All right, let's go and listen to what the bass is doing on the console. We have a secret weapon here. The secret weapon is this insert point here. Taking it out. Still sounds pretty good, but where's all that beautiful low end gone? Now it's back. It's this. And every single bass player I've shown this to has gone out and bought one of these. This is uh, a Poltec built by Steve Jackson, who owns Poltec now. Oh, such a great bass play. Also, keeping the cue nice and tight. So what happens, you've got this big boost, but then you're attenuating it, so it just focuses the boost a little bit more. So it's not just big, sloppy, low-end boost. And then the next thing is we're doing some 3K boost quite dramatically. So again, if I take that off, back on, 
Now I am high passing it at about 50. So I'm getting it out of the way of the kick drum. I'm doing some boost here at about 60. I'm also doing about a little bit of 350, 400. I'm doing some like 1K and I'm doing some 5K. So I'm getting fingers, I'm getting mid range and I'm getting low end. But really the secret of that blooming, beautiful low end is that Poltec, that 500 series Poltec. I schnizzle you not, every bass player, like all of the great bass players that come in here and track, end up buying one of these. Um, even Clark the other day said, how do you get such a great bass sound? Insert, pull it out, like, oh. Because you can boost plug-in wise, you can boost on a beautiful SSL and do all that kind of stuff, but that's magic. That thing is magic. It just adds so much beautiful low end. It's a, it's a 500 series Poltec and it's got the API 2520 op amp in it. Just before Poltec stopped, the original version of Poltec stopped making equipment, they were in, you know, in business with API using their 2520s inside of their gear. They were getting rid of tubes to do that. The piano I have up there, for instance, is going through, the piano is going through a pair of Poltecs, which also have 2520s. I would argue I have better, more controlled low end from that 500 series than I do from one of the 90 inch, 90 inch. Don't tell Steve, I don't want to upset him. But when people ask me about bass, I always recommend that. And it's about a quarter of the price. Yeah. And here's, let's listen to some of his piano. No EQ, no compression inside of the box. Peaking like crazy, he kept turning up. We weren't on top of it. We let it, let it record far too loud. Far too loud, far too loud. Sounds great, doesn't it? So, he's going through the piano. He's hitting the console far too heavily. It's compressing far too heavily. It's also going through these beautiful EQs over here where I'm boosting some 100, boosting some 5K. So 5K and 100, I'm treating it almost like a guitar, as it were. Really smashed, really amazing. Lots of compression going on. Some boosting at about 10K, nine on one side, 10 on the other. Bit of 5K, four and a half, 5K boost there as well. A little bit of cut in a low mid to 350. Like I said, a high pass at about 80. Take all that stuff off. I don't know how to explain it, but that compression, that EQ that the SSL gives with the Poltex and that extra kind of bite and that extra kind of low end, I don't know, it makes it sound like a record. If I take all that stuff out again, just listen to it. It's great, it sounds like a Nord, but doesn't it sound digital and perfect? So this is the digital perfect Nord. This is amazing. Now put this back in. It is completely and utterly destroying. The, comp the compression is far too much. We'll never do that again. But I wanted to show you honestly how this was done. And warts and all, I mean, I know, you know, when you're watching like these live videos of live bands and we all know the, the videos and some of them are some of the most successful channels and everything is like perfect because it's all been edited afterwards and tuned and timed and all that kind of stuff. This is not that. You know, we could have gone in here and used uh, a clip remover and made all these files look all pretty so you couldn't see the clip. You can still do that yourself. But what I wanted to do was show you four, four people that have never worked together coming down in a room for a couple of hours, recording a whole bunch of songs, and this is what you get, clips and all. It sounds freaking awesome. These are amazing musicians. Take it out. 
get her. There's something to be said with just energy and capturing the moment. As our good friend Ulrich Wilde says, when somebody says to him, what's the best microphone to use? He's like, the one that's in your hand. Whatever your tools are when you're ready to go, it's like, sure, would I have liked to have sound checked this? Or would I have liked the fact that, you know, he obviously at that point in the song, turned his volume up, put his foot down on the pedal and clipped it. Yeah, it would have been nice maybe, for but also, if we had turned it down, brought it down and click on that, we would have lost the energy and the extra attack. There's a lot of reasons why it sounds good and works. So many of the greatest recordings have these problems and I don't have a problem with that. I'm sure many of you do because, you know, people like to have opinions on it, but this is how it was done. So it was recorded, it was clipped, it wasn't perfect. Goodness, it sounds fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Last but no means least. Is Michael's guitars. I didn't do any compression on EQ. All the reverb is from the amp, all the effects, all the playing is all Michael. No DI, just the amp. Bit of drive comes on. Amazing, they have so much fun mixing this. I love it because it also reminds me of Robert Fripp. A 300 boost going on there, a bit of like 800 cut, a little bit of 2k cut, a little bit of 5k boost, 8k and above is taken out, and like 80 and below is taken out. Let's see what it sounds like with it now. 4 EQ. After EQ and compression. put that in with the bass and the keys, just so you can hear the interplay between these guys. Incredible energy. I would really argue that everything that's wrong about this is also what makes it right. Hitting the console too hard, stuff clipping, all of that stuff is what makes it exciting. It was all part of the moment and we were just going, let's try it again, let's try it again, let's try it again, let's do this. It was just fast moving, fast paced, incredible musicians learning songs as they went. A joy to work with. I hope that you all get an opportunity to work with players of this caliber. It is a wonderful, wonderful experience, I can tell you that. All right, I'm gonna unstrap myself here. So, you can download the multitracks down below there. Happy New Year, happy freaking New Year. Download these ones, mix them for yourself. If you're an Academy member, of course, we will be reviewing these mixes. And 
I really, really appreciate you all. It's been an amazing, amazing new year. Sorry. It has, it was an amazing 2022. We had an incredible time. I appreciate everything that you all do. Thank you, everyone that stuck with us and helped make incredible music together. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir. Welcome to all the new members of the Academy. It's going to be an amazing year. We're going to do tons of great stuff. Lots of traveling, lots of stuff from all over the world. It's going to be awesome. So long, farewell, au revoir, au revoir. Adios, tuzines, goodbye, ciao. Happy New Year.